Welcome everyone, this is our MagWest 2022 Triforce Percent panel, now that we can finally talk about it. I am Duango AC, this is the director of the project, Soren. Hi everyone. Soren did easily two thirds of the effort on this, but it was still a monumental effort from a bunch of people, you'll hear more about that in a minute. Um, so I drug this all the way over to this MagWest 2022 Triforce Percent panel just to take it all away. So, we're actually gonna go take a quick look at this console. All right, I'm gonna pull up some audio here. All right, so we're in the right place. I'm gonna uh, switch over to the top spot there. So we have a switch here, so we can switch what, which is uh, which, and here we go. Oh, that's the wrong one. Ah, that's the wrong one. That's the wrong one. It did not do anything. <laughs> it did nothing. <laughs> I made a mistake. So we should, we should, uh, we have to skip it. We have to skip the introduction. Oh, we'll get to that. Don't worry. We'll also skip the that. Yeah, we'll get to that. Also so, skip the explanation of what has happened. As, as you can see, uh, it's gotten a little bit loopy. Now, what just happened is, uh, this is what Taskbot's known for. We, we plug Taskbot into the console, and Taskbot pressed a lot of buttons very, very quickly. Uh, but the thing you're actually looking for is that green bar in the upper left-hand corner. And that means the console is pwned. Yes. So, congratulations, we already have Ace. Now, there's something I need to explain here. This is the actual Honest to Goodness cartridge. This is a real US 1.0 release gold cart. Uh, however, we currently have a flash card in here. And the reason for that is what you just saw that took us a few seconds took us much longer on stage at GDQ because the actual setup to get arbitrary code execution takes quite a while. Yeah, basically you have to be in the, like the top, you know, 50 on the leaderboard for Ocarina of Time in order to be able to do the setup for like speedrun. Yeah. So uh, anyone who is has, has that kind of skill can do the setup and we can't. So, uh, you know, on our team, Safe State was the only one who was able to do the setup. So, yeah. what is actually running here is a slightly modded game that makes Ace very easy to obtain. That's the only mod. There's no injected content. All of the contents are being injected now while we're talking about it. Yeah. There's, there's no custom content in this. All, all of the, the only change to this ROM is that when you walk forward there, where Link started and you walk forward, at that point time, the game will start jumping to the controllers and executing the controller data as code, which is exactly what the whole Ace setup the first 10 minutes of the run were originally safe state setting up glitches to have the game execute control and glitches code. So we have, this is called the shortcut ROM. You can build this ROM from our released code. If you can you put in the original ROM, it'll build the patch and, and create a patch version if you want that. Yeah, so I'm going to turn this down. We're going to switch over to some slides and I'll talk to you a little bit, what's about, a little bit what, about what just happened here. So the projector inevitably is going to not like this for just a second. And if you, if you feel lost, um, don't worry. It'll only be more lost later. Uh, it, it will get better. It will no, get better. That's, that's, not, that's not the right answer. <laughs> I know, I know. Uh, if you feel lost, uh, normally we would have started with an explanation of everything, uh, but we were leaving it to inject some stuff, which Correct. normally would be happening over the course of doing the run, is it fills up the memory with stuff that we injected, but we want to do that while we're talking about it. Exactly. So, so we'll we now did things start out of over order. from the beginning. And uh, so, uh, welcome to the <laughs> MagQuest 2022 Triforce Percent panel. Uh, what we just did was, again, just a reha rehash, we used a shortcut to get the ability to execute arbitrary code, something that Safe State did live at SGDQ earlier this year. At this time, Taskbot is now connected to controller ports two, three, and four, and we have a normal controller connected to controller port one. And here's what just happened in the last few seconds. So there's, there's quite a lot to unpack here, but once we got arbitrary code execution, we were able to, okay, we were able to inject a first bootstrapper that uh, allowed us to inject bootstrapper two that then modified how the game pulls for input, and then we're gonna walk through all these in a, in a, in a little bit. Uh, that then injected Bootstrapper 3, which then injected Bootstrapper 4, which then injected a hyperspeed loader. Does that sound like a lot? <laughs> okay, how do you feel about breaking this down just a little bit? Do you want me to break it down? Uh, well, we'll go through it. Okay. So, I mean, right. yeah, I wrote most of this, so yeah. I, I can break it down <laughs> if you want, but. So, this is, this is what the, uh, the controller data looks like in memory. And there's a couple of interesting things going on here, but the biggest thing to know is that each, uh, these sections here, we don't really have a ton of, uh, like, how do I phrase this? Like, the, these sections here 
are always going to be zero at the first bootloader, right? Yeah, this, this is representing the state of all of the buttons on yes. the four controllers yeah. and, and the control sticks. So like, you know, A, B, Z, start, et cetera, and then X and Y on the sticks. And so with the four controllers together, you get these six words. And we don't have enough ability to, to modify the bits in words two, three, five, and six. So we're just using words one and four to encode instructions. And instruction four here has to uh, always encode a jump to safety because it's when it's executing this code. If we don't jump back to safety, it'll just execute other things and then crash. So we only have effectively this instruction one that can execute once per frame when we get the ace and jump to controllers. Right. So I'm going to jump ahead a little bit, but if, if this sounds really technical, it is. Don't worry, the whole talk is not technical, but I wanted to at least break down why this is so crazy. <laughs> Mag wanted us to do a technical panel. So we do the first 20 minutes are technical, and then the next 30 minutes are like backstory and emotional stuff and that kind of stuff. So. Right. No need to run away if you're intimidated by the code. Yeah, don't worry. We're going to get out of it. But this should reinforce exactly how crazy it was to make this even work. So we have a bunch of uh, issues we have to overcome just to get this first, uh, first bootloader working. But the, the, the key takeaway here is we can only get one instruction per frame. Uh, there's only 20, uh, 20 poles per second. or Basically, we're only doing 20 frames per second. So. Uh, we actually have that because we send every instruction twice. So our final rate is only 10 instructions per second at this first bootloader. So it's very, very slow. So yes, we can execute arbitrary code, but it's not exactly ideal. So, so when you have a genie, and I'm borrowing this from Bismuth, by the way, when you, if, you, if you have a genie in a bottle and it gives you one wish, what you do is you ask for more wishes. Yes. So that's exactly what we did here. Yeah. So we're constantly loading and storing. Um, we're writing another program. We're using yeah. the arbitrary code execution to write another program into memory, which we will then execute, which is our next set of wishes. So we're not going directly from one wish to infinite wishes. We're going from one wish to like three wishes, and then, or something, you know, to, yeah. to extend the metaphor a little bit. So here's what we want to do. Now that we have the ability to wish for more wishes and continue to maintain control, the first thing we want to do is go a whole lot faster. So. Uh, we re-enable controller ports two and four. We jump to the, that allows us to jump to the controller data right away. Uh, there's a wonder item overlay that we won't get into, um, but basically that gets us to the point where with bootloader two, now we're running at 60 frames, uh, 60 times a second, uh, two bytes per two instructions. We're basically getting 60 bytes per second. It's it's not a great data rate, but it's, it's, it's better, better than what it was. Yeah, it's better, but we can do faster. So I'm going to jump ahead a fair bit here. Uh, actually, well, I jumped over three. Somewhere. That's fine. Yeah, that's okay. That's so really three matter. is the same thing as one, but at the faster rate. And yeah. then it puts in four, and then four is this. So four takes bits from controllers two, three, and four, 64 bits, and injects those every frame. So we get eight bytes per frame, which is 480 bytes per second. Yes, yeah, 64 bits. And we use that to inject the final, uh, the final part of the bootstrapping, which is called the hyperspeed lo loader. This was mainly made by another person on the team, uh, Terrace the Bird. Um, I helped a little bit. But um, this is now part connected to the operating system in the N64 and uh, pulling the controllers eight times per frame now and taking all of the bits from controllers two, three, and four, putting them into a packet, taking the, con the bits from controller one and giving them to the game like normal so you can still play. And then, based on what the contents of that packet, it can write data to memory, execute code, um, and inject Twitch messages at the end, which you haven't seen the run yet. Uh, you know, spoilers. Yeah, there will be spoilers here. But that gives us a final rate of 5,400 bytes per second, so 5.4 yeah, kilobytes per second. So this is roughly like a dial-up modem speed. Yeah. And this is happening right now. Yep. Taskbot, this, you know, the, the, we switched away the HDMI, but uh, Taskbot has been... Yeah, is it and done? it's done, yeah. It's done. So in the last, you know, seven minutes or so, we injected all of the data that we'll need for the rest of the project. Um, the, uh, we have the expansion pack installed, which is extra memory. Um, that's, you know, a legitimate Nintendo accessory that came with Majora's Mask and some other games. Um, and it's not used by Ocarina of Time, so it's just an extra four megs of RAM sitting there that we can put data in, and so while save state was just messing around in the Lost Woods and going through the exits and talking to the beta Kokiri, we were injecting the data for the ending and like the rest of the project, which is, you know, the ending is most of the data. So, uh, you know, then that's, that, was, that was there, and then when we got to it, we used it. Yeah, and how we use it? Well, we have this packet format that was set up by the team, allows us to uh, 
say where we want to upload data to, and then up to, I believe it's a total of 81 bytes, unless I'm mistaken. Yeah, 81 bytes per yeah. frame. And yeah. that can be written to memory wherever we want, which could you know, overwrite contents for you know, changing code or whatever. But it could also just load data into the expansion pack for later use. Yeah. The other thing you could do is call a, 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 a command. Uh, it also had the same type of header set up with up to four arguments, looks like. Yeah. yeah. So that was which function to call. And then the last thing is some chat stuff we won't get into too much, but it was just a list of chat messages. And these were the only three packet types that we had. Uh, that's not really true, but really? those are the main ones that we used. Oh, OK. All right. Uh, there's one other thing to talk about. Uh, that is yeah. so data transfer. Yeah, why don't you take this one? So um, part of the TaskBot ethos is that TaskBot is doing what a normal human could do, except much faster. But if you slowed it down by, let's say, a 1,000 times, this would all be possible for a person to do. So there's no cheating except for the speed. So we need to get data from the console back to the computer. Because if anything at any time went wrong in the transfer of data, and we didn't get any kind of acknowledgment back, then the data would just be wrong on the console. And then we would use it later, and it would be wrong and probably crash. And so we need to get data back. But that needs to be in a way that a human could respond to if it was you know, thousands of times slower. So we installed virtual rumble packs in the controllers 2, 3, and 4 that TaskBot is emulating. And the, we have code that is running that will send back the states of those three rumble motors from them on and off in a pattern that will encode data to basically say whether this was, uh, yeah, we'll skip that. Sorry, we I actually used had the wrong pack, but, <laughs> Yeah, um, we could have used compact, we didn't. Yeah, so it was, you know, again, it, person could have done this except for the speed. So you could, you know, you could hold the three controllers and feel, oh, this, these two are rumbling. That means that there was an error, you know, look up in your spreadsheet or whatever. Um, yeah, so that's how we got data back to the host, but that was mainly for error checking and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think that's all for the, oh yeah, there's a rumble. I knew yeah, there were some the rumbles. So yeah, one rumble, something wrong, two rumbles okay. Or yeah, it's, it's a little more complicated than that. Yeah. But that was the version for. <laughs> by the way, these slides are from Retro Game Mechanics Explained. Isofreeze yes. um, made them. You know. I should have mentioned that at the beginning. Yeah. Yes. Isofreeze, huge credit to them uh, for, uh, for him, him making these. Uh, these are really helpful slides. <laughs> I'm yes, not so doing them YouTube. justice. He, he was at GDQ with us. He pressed the button to upload it right after we finished the run. So it's been up since the beginning. You can look it up. Um, by the way, any of the, if you want more info on this, um, get triforce.link. Is the is the website? Yep. Uh, you can go to get triforce.link to see more information about that. I'm going to close out of that so it's not consuming things. Let's get you some volume here. Yes. All right. So now we're going to show you what we can do with all that. Yeah. So this is something that we showed. This is the Arbing for Yeah. This is real beta content, and we'll we'll get into later more about what's real and what's not real. Um, but yeah, I, I didn't give myself any. Uh, uh, so it's hard to play sideways like this, but yeah. this is an example of real beta content that was actually there on the cartridge. We just had to run a few instructions to cause it to spawn. Um, but that was like the first thing that we showed, and you know, this was part of uh, waiting around for data to inject. But I'm going to jump to later, I'm going to jump to the Triforce, you think? Yeah, I think so. so uh, we have. We added uh, button combos that would let us warp to any point in the project because in case it crashed while we were performing live and we had to like redo the setup and then jump to later. Um, so this scene, not left on the cartridge, and I'll go over what was what later again, but uh, not left on the cartridge, but this was a scene that we made by Nintendo when the Strike Force Round, we you know, looked at the, looked at the old videos and screenshots and recreated it um, you know, with, with, our, with our tools. And yeah, I wanted to make sure that the text that was on the screen when the, you got the Triforce was text that couldn't have possibly been in the ROM because it's self-referential. It says 23 years. So, you know, just It, that, it still it, wasn't enough. It wasn't enough. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about that, too. But um, yeah, just like if this screenshot got shared around, people would think, oh, wait a minute. That says 23 years. That can't be. So anyway, well, let, 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 let this continue here. Um, do you want to switch to the other slides while we're? Uh, no. 
sure. Do you want to? Uh, do you right, want well, to let this play? Yeah, out? I'll let this. I'll let this play out. But while you're no, 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 don't, don't, don't pull the plug. Just like switch to your slide, to switch to the other slides. Oh, you have it. Up. Okay. I, sorry, yeah, but they sorry can't see that. it. Yeah, I know they can't see. It. Okay. I was saying. Okay, you oh. already did. Sorry yeah. about that. <laughs> yeah, uh, we didn't. We didn't have much rehearsal time. I'm in charge of lighting at main stage, so I was just working all weekend, and I did you know load up, load out this morning or, or tear down this morning. So. And I had another panel or another uh, calathon run yesterday that kept me busy. So yeah, you know yeah. it happens. It's mag mag time. But that's okay. Yeah. So if you haven't seen uh, Triforce Percent, you know this is the ending, or this is you know part of the ending. Um, you know, Link has gotten the Triforce, and uh, now he's being spoken to by the goddesses, and they're going to ask him what he wishes for. And we have a little bit of a, um, you know, our own fan theory about this. Well, let me first say, so like, when you see this this set of three choices, we designed the choices so that the other two choices were were silly that nobody would want them, and then we were surprised when people actually wanted to be king of Hyrule. Or wanted rupees. Um, we did consider the idea of doing rupees and having a donation incentive, but like it would have had to be like thousands or tens of thousands in order to have the right impact, and that would have meant like we would have had to shell out so so much money. So we didn't we didn't do that. Yeah. Um, but yeah. So the, the other options don't actually do anything. The code it completely ignores what dialogue option you choose. But so the idea was we wanted to see the future, so we pick things that people wouldn't choose as the other options. But we have a fan theory about this, that this is the goddess's final test of Link to see if his heart actually, you know, because the whole idea of the, the project was that, you know, we go through this, this custom plot that we created where Link proves his courage, power, and wisdom and becomes eligible to wield the whole Triforce. Because if he just walks up to it and touches it, he'll get the Triforce of Courage, but he won't get the other pieces. And that's not, you know, that's not what we wanted. He had the Triforce of Courage in Ocarina of Time. We wanted him to get the whole Triforce. So, um, you know, it's our, our, our sort of our fan fan theory about our own project that this was a test from the goddesses. If he, if he chose the others, he would have, you know, gotten to be king of Hyrule. He would have gotten a big full wallet, but that would have been it. Whereas, see the future, you get, you know, sort of a magical transcendent experience. So, um, yeah, and so this is what happens next. And I'll remind you all that this is a real N64 and a mostly unmodified copy of the game, except for that shortcut which we mentioned at the beginning, that's a couple hundred bytes of changes. All of this stuff that you're seeing here has been injected by the controller input, by, by, by TaxBot. Yeah, um, and it's also not live video. We have done that trick before. We could not do this that <laughs> trick with nope. N64. Actually, the bandwidth we can get through the controllers on N64 is much lower than on yeah. Super Nintendo. Yeah, much lower. Um, much, like hundreds of times or something. So we tried, but we couldn't do it, so we had to actually do it in engine. So, you know, the tricks here are, this is a high poly model, or it's like 15, uh, 1,700 tries for Breath of the Wild Link, compared to Ocarina of Time Link is like 500, so it's more than three times more complex. And also cell shaded. So until last year, it was thought that the N64 could not do cell shading. Um, and then uh, myself and Glank, who is a big, he made, basically made the OOT practice ROM, so he's like a huge, huge N64 person. Um, the two of us figured out a way to do it, and then this was all private and secret. And then after we figured it out, two other people figured out other ways to do cell shading that are totally different implementations. So now there's three ways to do cell shading from zero to three. Um, we also have voice acting. So everyone sees the voice acting is like that can't possibly be hardware. It's would be just nice like the, the game plays other audio samples. This is just longer audio samples. It's not, you know, we have we had to inject the data for the, the audio, but it's it's I mean it's not wave files, it's, it's an internal format, but it's really not any different from you know any injecting any of the other data that we injected. Yeah. And at this moment, I think it's worth touching a little bit on the emotion because this moment in the run, we invited anyone who was watching the stream, whether they were sitting at home in another country, in the studio audience or in the in the main audience uh, there at the event, we asked all of them to come together to say here together in chat. Now we're not going to demonstrate that here. You can hit uh, yeah. forward. Look! But imagine. And you'll see in the video. Hundreds and hundreds of names popping up so fast that we broke Twitch chat, which is not the first time we've done that. But, you know, we, we overloaded Twitch's servers and they came in a batch format. So you yeah. can see all these messages in an individual way. Of course, they never happened during the testing because we yeah. always tested with just a couple people. Yeah. Um, so, oh well. Um, that's the first time that's happened. But uh, yeah, it works well enough. And you, you even see me in the video, I'm like, oh, they're coming in like that. Oh well, whatever, it's good enough. You know? 
it wasn't in our control. He yeah. wants to see our future. Here it is. It at this moment that my emotional capacity just overwhelmed me. <laughs> I, I, you can see me in the video, but yes, I'm supposed to be stoic and just sitting there quietly while everyone is enjoying it. I couldn't do it. <laughs> like my emotions got the better of me. Um, the emotional impact of this was more than I expected, to be honest. This moment was very, very special. And I'll just touch on, here together, you know, when we were designing that, that meant, you know, Zelda brought people together. Thank you. Or GDQ Thank. brought people together. Huh? It also all ended up being together in person. But yes, also Listen together. carefully. Zelda Hime, arigato. Ishou ni mirai wo tsukurimashou ka? First time Link speaks. It's our, our last little hurrah of, you know, we can do what we want here. But we wanted it to be a Japanese voice and just a very short thing. So, sort of like Mario said, Thank you so much for playing my game at the end. You know, he doesn't speak throughout the game, but we don't want Link to speak throughout the game. But, you know, it's, it represented our, you know, represented a lot of things. And basically, you know, Zelda and Link are giving the take home message, or part of the take home message. She says, You asked to see our future, here it is, gesturing at the fans. Um, and then Link says, Let us create the future. So, so you see, was, go ahead. No, no yeah. that's just that's the that's the take-home message we have. The characters themselves tell you the message, and then I repeat it at the end of the end credits speech, which I did, so, which yeah. was very well memorized. Uh, what you're seeing on screen is the names of everyone who helped. There was a huge number of people. We estimate over two dozen people over the course of easily two and a half years. Yeah, and I'll get into into that more in the second half. Yeah. Uh, but you're seeing some of the names on screen. Uh, there's even beta content in the end of this. We showed a lot of beta content throughout. We showed a lot of custom content throughout. Um, the, the, these are all cutscenes. This is still the game. Yeah. Like this is still hacked up. You know, Ace Ocarina of Time with our cutscenes and our names and our music and everything. Um, you know, some people didn't realize that. I guess the, well, we'll get into that more, but people just sort of thought that at some point it was all real and then we switched to a video or something for the ending. Yeah. People saw the Twitch messages and they're like, well, N64 can't connect to the internet, therefore, oh, I should just mention that this is a beta cutscene. Yeah. Not the names, but the actual camera movement. That's a, like a beta version of the staff roll camera flying through the Fury Forest. It's left on the cartridge, so we just, you know, co opted that. Uh, and we worked with some, I should also mention, we worked with some partners all on the screen there. Shout out to Siva Gunner, which I am not supposed to say that I'm in, but that's why they you know, worked with us on this. Um, and yeah, so. Oh, and I look very oh yeah, the, there's the, also the Desert Pyramid here in the background that you see there as it's fading out. That's also an urban legend. It's just like the edge of a wall, but like if the camera is in the right place and there's fog, it looks like a pyramid. And so, you know, we made the camera go there. You have the ESA. Content. Yes, this is the ESA version. Yeah. Uh, so we've got to tell you, warn you about that. Yeah, we, I, I, I thought about that before. So it's going to say presented at European, whatever. Yeah. So, yeah. In the end, you know, copyright us, copyright Nintendo. In the end. So, let's switch to our second half of our panel. Yeah. And let's see what we're doing on time. It is um, 324. That's so, not so bad. Right. See. All right. So I'll I'll tell you slide because I'll slide. Yeah. Yes. So history. So um, the ideas behind this, and this is all you know, sort of unscripted. I just wanted to talk about this. Uh, there's, there's the end of the technical part, beginning of the emotional part. So um, the ideas of this. I mean, this this all goes back to the urban legends of the late '90s with Ocarina of Time, that you know people saw content in magazines that didn't make it into the final game. They saw content that they could get with a Game Shark. As people were like pulling apart the code, they saw more more pieces of it. The game always pointed outside itself because of the way it was sort of unfinished and you know rushed from the N sixty four DD to the cartridge and everything. So it was you know that there was always this sense that there was more to the game than you could see, and the what was in the cart was in the cart, but there always was more to the game that you could see, which was the ace exploit that was there the whole time, and people didn't know about it, and then once it was discovered, then all of this became possible. So it wasn't the thing that everybody wanted, you know, the, the, the Triforce, getting the Triforce isn't possible without Ace. It's the, that scene is not on the cartridge, but the Ace exploit is on the cartridge, and so with a lot of button presses, 
we can make that real. Um, so this is where this all came out of, you know, there's, there's a ton of people who were thinking about what the game could have been. Um, you know, people have been working on Ace for many, many years. Um, you can hit the slide. So this is uh, Mr. Cheese made a Ace of Pokemon where he put Mew under the truck. So if you don't know the urban legend, there was an urban legend that you could use strength on this truck. I haven't played Pokemon, so pardon me if the details are wrong, but there's a truck somewhere. You could use some strength ability, push the truck, and underneath you would find Mew. And that wasn't true, but Mr. Cheese did Ace, made a hacked save file that had a, 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 like a hacky Pokemon, and you could connect this to your friend's Game Boy and transfer them this Pokemon and then it would corrupt their game, and then it would give Ace on that game, and then it would put Mew under the truck, and you could actually do push the truck and with strength and find Mew. And so, you know, that was part of the inspiration, but that wasn't the only inspiration. But on that video, four years ago, I left a comment saying, I hope we can do this in Ocarina of Time so that we can get the Triforce. And that was, you know, a year and a half before the exploit was found in Ocarina of Time. So when the exploit was found, we started I started within a week, I was like, okay, I have this one chance to do this in, like, in all of history. There's, nev there's never going to be another game that has this kind of meta content outside of it that we can use Ace and, and bring to life. I mean, if we, found, like, if we found Ace in Mario 64, we could put in Luigi. We have the models from the Giga League or whatever, but that's a little different. Um, that's sort of like one thing. So anyway, um, you know, this has been thought about since back then. At that time, in uh, November 2019, when the exploit was found, I started a development uh, internal Discord and a, a Git repo, and just like started trying to recruit people and making proof of concept at first. I made a proof of concept of the Triforce scene just with ROM hacking tools, and went to MAGFest 2020, and met Duango there, and uh, he was kind enough to listen to some rando who had no task experience, and almost no ROM hacking experience, and I said I wanted to do this, and he said, okay, that sounds like a cool idea. Well, what did you say? What's your I said, well, all right, I'm going to connect you to a bunch of people that can help. Right. Um, because just to say it really quickly, uh, the TaskBot community is well over 2,000 people on our Discord server in particular. Uh, Discord.gg slash TaskBot, if you'd like to join, we'd love to have you. I am not a master of all of these things, but I do know a lot of really amazing people, so I knew that I could connect Soren with the right people. And I did. Yes, that's you know why I why I went to you basically. Um, I wanted to mention another little anecdote here. So yeah, um, back while I was in college, I had my trusty TI eighty four, and I made a port with very big quotes over it of Ocarina of Time to the Gryphon calculator. Um, it filled up almost the entire RAM. Like there's no room for other programs because it was all like text based. Um, not you know not very good quality game. Not going to be releasing it. Um, or anything like that, but uh, you can just see a couple screenshots here from that. Um, you know, the typical typical OOT stuff. So it's just like menus for each area that you're in, and then it would like check if you had the item to let you go to the next area and that kind of thing. Um, uh, I, I don't know if you can see this, but it says, unless I'm mistaken, Mary Rudo? Question yeah, yeah. mark? Okay. This is actually a real text from OOT. The second and the third one are actually real text from, the, the, from OOT. The first one is paraphrased, but that's basically what he says. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. You, you didn't know that? You, I didn't know about you, that one. You played OOT. Yeah, but I don't remember. Okay. Yeah, after you get the Zora Sapphire, and she's like, you have to be my, you know, I can give this to you, but only if you will agree to marry me, because this is the Zora's engagement. I do right. remember that. I didn't realize that was what the prompt said. Okay. It was, it was something like that. Okay. Anyway, you get the idea. So at the, you know, at the end, so what I did in this version, and this was in like 2011, um, and again, like I am not complaining, c claiming that this is good at all. This was trash. But <laughs> what I did in this trashy version is I, I, I implemented the child link part of the game, and then I implemented, based on a glitch, stealing the fishing rod, I implemented a secret side quest that would lead to an alternate ending where you like resolve the Skyward Sword timeline and all of that stuff. And it was pretty bad. It was pretty, you know, cringe fan fiction kind of stuff. Um, but uh, the idea of using a glitch that was actually in the game of being able to steal the fishing rod and then making a plot out of that was in this from 10 years ago. So, you know, that, that, uh, that became sort of the same idea. And I am, you know, it made me so happy to rediscover this on my calculator, see that 
ending screen. This is from you know the ending of the calculator port when you when you find the secret ending, and then ten years later to make this ending screen and you know be able to be able to make it real. And by the way, these these screenshots are from a special emulator that does low-level emulation of both the RSP and RDP, which is needed for our project. Um, so you can't just run this in any emulator. It'll have graphical problems um, because of the cell shading and stuff. But anyway, um, yeah, so that's part of that. Let's make, keep going. So a lot of people were wondering what was on the cartridge. This is all on our website, by the way. Get triforce.link. You know, we, we were very, very uh, happy about that being clever. Yes, um, <laughs> and available. Yeah, well, yeah, uh, Triforce.link was not available. Yeah, on. sadly. Anyway, so, um, yeah, so this is the stuff that was actually on the cartridge um, that we, you know, because, because, okay, so we started out and we said, oh, this is a, you know, OOT beta showcase. Um, we're going to be showing, you know, beta and debug content for Ocarina of Time, including content left on the game cartridge. So we say including, but we don't say, but not limited to. Um, so people got the idea, and we'll talk about that in a, a couple of slides, but people got the idea that it was all on the cartridge. And by the end, when it's Breath of the Wild and Twitch chat, you have to realize that was not on the cart. But you'd be amazed how many people don't. <laughs> yeah. One person was uh, reacting to this on YouTube, saw Breath of the Wild, and they were like, there's no way that that was on the cartridge, right? It's like the Breath of the Wild model. We Okay, anyway, so... And it's not just one. I probably can point to about 100 comments like that. <laughs> it's yeah, amazing. Yeah, so we'll, we'll get to that, that aspect in a moment. But anyway, <laughs> this is the list. And the things that say arguable, by the way, those, what we showed is not on the cartridge, but there are some hints or elements of that that are there so that we can say that this is like, we've you know, brought this to life or, or created what it could have been or something like that. So there is, there is some hint that implies that this may have been considered in some way, but the actual contents that were not. So for example, melting the ice in Zora's domain. The way the actor is set up in the, in the scene for the ice and the water, it's one actor that handles both of them, and it can handle, like it checks every frame for whether Link is child or adult for which one to, to do, which it's the, the condition is whether Link is child or adult. The condition is not, have you set a flag for have you melted the ice? So it's not, it does not support melting the ice live, but they would only have to change a couple of lines of code to make it support that. And that's not the sort of the normal way that they would have made that. They would have made two different scene setups with two different actors or an actor with different parameter. Sorry if that's going over most of your heads, but there's, there's a different way that they might have done it if they were never intending you to be able to melt the ice. And the way they did it looks like it was sort of prepared to be able to do that if they made a small change. So that's what we're talking about, like arguable, these, that, that kind of thing. Slide, please. And then these are the things that are not on the cartridge. So the left list is things that were actually made by Nintendo way back when, shown in like screenshots and videos from the, the you know, mid-90s, but were not left on the cartridge. And so we remade them completely from scratch you know, with our you know, team 3D modeling and whatever. Um, so you can say that they're real beta content, because Nintendo actually, you know, like you can see the old screenshots of the Triforce room, but it was not actually on the cartridge. And then there's things that were urban legends that we didn't make up, but somebody else made up. So the Overture of Sages made up by Ariana Almondos. That's sort of the most famous one. And then, of course, the idea of beating the Running Man. Everybody, you know, so many urban legends about, oh, you do run around this tree 64 times, and then you can beat the Running Man or whatever. And so, and then there's the, the stuff that we made up. So nobody had thought of Running Man boss battle. We thought, you know, okay, you beat him. Well, he just gives you something. No, he's, he's got to be upset. He's going to kick your ass. And you have to actually beat him. Right. You, you beat him in the race by cheating. And then, and a lot of people got that we were playing with things when it went through this whole cheater storyline because we had a corrupted timer and we played with the time and went back in time. And then, you know, he calls us a cheater and then he says we cheated better than him. And it's like, it, it was sort of a meta thing, but yeah, it's anyway. interesting the suspension of disbelief, though. Right. So that brings us to the next slide. This is the slide on presentation. So we're sort of in a in a in a mixed mixed kind of situation after the project in terms of the whole what was beta content issue because basically what happened is we we showed this and a lot of people thought way more of it was actually left on the cartridge than actually was. And people reacted, responded to that in sort of three different ways. One is that people sort of realized at some point through the presentation 
that it wasn't like they thought that it was all data content left in the cartridge, and then at some point in the presentation they realized it wasn't, and then they felt like cheated or spoiled in some. They had some negative response to that. Uh, most people had a positive response to that experience, but some people had a negative response. Some people like thought it was all real, and then found out in the YouTube comments or whatever, found out in some other sense that it wasn't, and then would like argue or whatever. And then some people just never found out at all and just still think that you can get the Triforce in Ocarina of Time without Ace. Because you can get the Triforce in Ocarina of Time if you do Ace, but you know, not without it. So, um, and part of that was because we, we, we presented this as beta showcase. So that was an aspect where you know, this, is, this project is called Triforce Percent. We wanted to surprise people with the Triforce. We wanted people to, who knew about these urban legends to figure out where it was going as they were watching it and realize, oh, there, this looks like it's gonna be, a, you know, this looks like it's going that way. And, you know, we succeeded in creating that experience for those people. And for a lot of other people, it was just like, oh, this is a cool technical showcase. And then the ending was, you know, meaningful and everything. Um, but we had to say it was something for GDQ. Like we can't just say OOT something. Like we ha we have to say something about it. And it's true that we showcased beta content that was left on the cartridge and also beta content that was not left on the cartridge. And we never said that it was all beta content. But people, you know, most people just this isn't like a slight against anybody, but just like most humans at most times in their life are not putting a huge amount of intellectual capacity towards everything they're reading. People just see something and just interpret it. And that's like, again, that's this isn't a criticism about anybody. Like, you know, I do that, everybody, that's just how we engage with the world. And so people heard beta content, people heard left on the cartridge, and then they just, the, the easiest conclusion to come to was it was all left on the cartridge. It was all real beta content, and that wasn't the case. We were very clear about what we said, and you know, careful wording. But careful wording goes over the heads of most people, and that's again, that's not their fault. That's not a slight against them. That's just that's the reality of how humans work. So we are sort of we sort of have mixed feelings about, it, or at least I do. I guess you you do as well. Um, you know, we we don't we didn't want to spread misinformation. We put up the website immediately after we, we link to it from you know all of our partners videos and everything um, but a lot of you know wrong ideas got out there into the world and I, you know I'm sorry about that um, I also don't know what we could have done differently and still maintained the experience of suspension of disbelief for everybody because if we could have said every step of the way this is content that we injected with ace we could have done that that would have tempered the hype of the project, at best. It would have been a lower key experience. Um, and some people would still not have understood. Yeah. Because there's still the whole technical aspect of like, what is Ace? What are you, 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 you said this is not a modified cartridge, but how are you, you're obviously changing the content, so what, you know, how does this work? And so, you know, even, we couldn't have done anything like this. We couldn't have done anything of Link getting the Triforce without the risk of somebody screenshotting Link with the Triforce and putting that up out of context and then somebody else sees that and gets the wrong idea. So, and it was too good to not do it. So, we did it and, you know, here we are and we've tried as much as we could to sort of, you know, damage control the, the, uh, the issues. Um, but, you know, another, another perspective just to say is like, if you're talking about harm, the harm that was done is that some people think that there is data on a cartridge from 1998 that wasn't there. So this isn't like, you know, misinformation about serious things that affect people's lives or whatever. And the, yeah, and the information is out there. Yeah. It's on our website. It's you know, it's we're not hiding things now. So, um, you know, that's that's my 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 piece to say about it is I'm sorry that that was the outcome, but I'm you know, still satisfied overall with how we presented it. And I think that's what we, what we needed to do is how, how roughly, you know, how we presented it. Yeah, and a lot of the things we prepared for people to be upset about, no one really mentioned. I've had one comment in all of the comments on the videos. One person has complained that Link spoke. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was gonna be, I thought I was gonna get roasted on Twitter for that. I know. And, um, we were also, yeah, so a lot of, uh, maybe 5% or you know a couple percent of the people who saw this thought the ending was cringe 
And <laughs> that, like that, I'm totally fine with. Yeah, like I, out of sure. all of this stuff that I'm going to be talking about of like, oh, I wish it could have been different. I, I don't care about that. And the reason is that, first of all, if we make 95% of the people happy and 5% of the people don't like it, great. Like that's most things that people do in the world don't have such a high level of, of positivity coming out of it. Right. But then also even beyond that, this was creating an emotional experience for people. Some people are not you know, ready or in the, having the right day or whatever is in their life to have that kind of emotional experience or they just not, didn't connect to it in the way that we did it. And so, you know, that's okay. That it's, we, not, not everybody has to love everything that, that you make. So, um, you know, we're, I, I was totally fine with the comments saying this is cringe, like, okay, you know, make your own thing. I hope I hope you get a lot of views, and not like in a sarcastic way. Like, please, you know, make your contribution to society, and I I hope it goes well for you, and I hope everyone loves it. So, um, this brings us to impact. So, you know, that was some of the some of the uh, you know shadow side. We say the you know flip the light side and the shadow side of things. So stick with the Zelda motif. Um, first impact, and this is not why I did the project. This is a large yeah, part of why Wango did the project. Is uh, yeah, this is, is the money. Well, not our money. Not our, yeah, not money for us, <laughs> money for Doctors Without Borders. So this was the biggest project that had been done under the Taskbot banner. And I can't tell you the impact this had on me personally of seeing the goal set to $225,000. And yeah, it kind of felt like maybe it was getting close, but let me tell you, I've been at enough of these events. This was not close at all. People would have easily overshot this if we hadn't ended the end of the donation. Even with them stopping this donation incentive, it's still overshot and hit 228,518, uh, 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 I'm sorry, 15, <laughs> 585. Whatever, 228K. Yes, $585. Uh, it was way bigger than I ever expected it to be. And, and just to be clear, this money was raised for Doctors Without Borders. Yes. We did not make a cent of no. this. We put in <laughs> lots of money, lots of money <laughs> yeah. to you know hardware and all kinds of stuff. And to get there, and, yeah. yeah. And obviously, all of this equipment, uh, even this gold cart, this, this this cartridge is now almost a hundred bucks these days. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, this was this was not something we made any money off of. This was by far the single biggest impact that Taskbot content has ever had. And just so that I can say it. I fully want to thank Soren in particular for being the tent pole to make this happen. So thank you. Sure, uh, you're <laughs> welcome, and thank you for your role in this. This isn't the end of the presentation, by the way. But no. um, yeah, this you know I didn't do it for that reason. I did it for the reasons that will be explained in the next slides. But I was still happy to, you know, I mean, Doctors Without Borders. That much money must have is probably going to save a few dozen lives. So you know that's that's uh, that's by itself that's that's something to be said. So um, this is an email that I got the next day from somebody. This excerpt, I you know, removed their name because I'm sure they wouldn't want it to be uh, published. But uh, we got a lot of comments like this. Um, one person said that it saved their life. I don't know how serious they were being about that. But we got enough comments of people saying, like, I was having a really hard time. And then you know, this, this brought me to my past and you know, gave me an experience that I'll never forget and that kind of thing. Um, this is largely what I, why I did it. Um, but. The, I'll get more into what I what I did uh, in a couple of later slides. Yeah, but it was really impressive to me that across the board, sure, there were some complaints we talked about earlier, but in all of the years I've been doing this, ever since 2013, I've never had so many people with so many heartwarming stories of how this touched them, how it brought back something from their childhood. And yeah, and we'll talk about the childhood about that, yeah. part at the, uh, towards the end of the presentation. Yeah, just a um, huge impact, but yeah. okay. So next, next slide. So speaking of complaints. <laughs> <laughs> so as you know, I, 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 I'm in two positions here, right? Because I'm, I'm a you know, fan of Ocarina of Time, fan of beta content. You know, I care about the stuff that Nintendo made, and I obviously care about what I made. Um, you know, I would have loved for this to all be available to the community. Also, as the you know director of a big project like this, it's my job to keep the project and the people involved with the project out of legal trouble. Um, distributing ROMs is not legal. Distributing patch files is sometimes legal, depending on what is in the patch file. Uh, if it is a small patch of, you know, a few bytes or whatever, it's, it's almost certainly legal. If it's like an entire fan mod crammed into a patch file, 
probably not. There's probably copyrighted data in the patch file that is being distributed. Uh, but So that's why we didn't distribute a patch file. We did put up on GitHub all of the code and assets that we made, that our team made, not including any Nintendo assets. So it's like 85% of all of the data that was injected. Um, even, uh, you know, like all the code, all the tools, um, you know, any, any 3D models that we made, any textures that we made, we removed textures that were ripped from Ocarina of Time because like we reused textures from the game in the custom scenes, things like that. Um, but like even in, the, in those cases, like we put up the Blender file and it just has the textures missing. So it's like almost all there, but with this, these few pieces missing. And it's buildable. You can build this, you can run it yourself, but it, the missing content is missing. So that is the answer. I'm, you know, I'm not happy to be, you know, people have accused us of trying to gatekeep this from people or, you know, whatever. And like, I understand it feels hypocritical, but I also have, you know, we have a responsibility to yeah. our, our team and our communities to not bring the wrath of Nintendo onto us. You know, if they, at best, if we released, if we put stuff up, at best, it would just all get taken down. And that wouldn't serve anybody because better to have 90% of it up for posterity than none of it up. Um, and, you know, then at worst they could, you know, pursue all kinds of different things and we just want to avoid that. Yeah. So, uh, well, the optics would be terrible if they came after the Taskbot side of things. It, it would really curtail us. We've now helped, between all of the different events, we've now helped raise over $1.3 million for charity. And I want to keep going. I don't want to stop here. But if we make a wrong step here, Nintendo could force us to stop. And I don't want that. It's yes. also why Taskbot has a completely new form. Uh, we yes. moved entirely away from Nintendo assets for exactly the same reason. So yeah, I mean that's that that's the answer to the question. So you know, again, everything that we've distributed is on our GitHub. There's a link from gettriforce.link to the GitHub, or you can just Google it. It's GitHub.com/triforce-percent/triforce-percent. Um, yes. Uh, next one. Yeah. So another thing I wanted to talk about is um, the biggest for me. The biggest struggle of the project was the working with people. Um, not that I'm like an antisocial type, but just the sense that this was a lot of things to do, and the people who have who are out there in the world who have the skills to be able to do this are few, and many of them are not available, and the ones that are available charge money. So like, our animations were not great because we didn't, you know, we didn't have a way to pay for professional animators as part of this, and then we got you know volunteers and. You know, this was a lot, and they did some work, and you know, people people do what they can do in their lives with their free time, and we have to deal with that. And so, as a director, that was difficult for for the reason of just like want, having a vision and then not being able to bring it to fruition in various ways. Um, though it's still, it, you know, I would say I was ninety five percent satisfied with the uh, you know what what this looked like at the end. Um, but yeah, uh, that was that was a struggle. But the other half of the struggle was was on me, and that's why I say and lessons learned, um, because I don't want to make this as like, oh well, people just didn't do enough work. Well, first of all, I should say there were a number of people who did big chunks of the project, who this this couldn't have happened without them. Um, for example, like, there's many people, but for example, Ali one two three four from the Taskbot team. Uh, converted the Breath of the Wild models by hand. So take them into Blender, like you have tens of thousands of triangles, do like decimate operations and stuff, and then manually go over the triangles and you know get them down to the N64 level. So very labor. It was like it was like 20 hours just for that. So that kind of thing, like you know, I'm very thankful for those for that work. But even beyond that, for the for the people that we had sort of, um, you know, that it, it was difficult to to. Uh, find a level of work that they were capable to offer and that was you know would work for the project uh, part of that was on me um, and I have uh, I have high standards and I have a very direct way of communicating about things of like oh this is what I want you know I'm an engineer right I'm by, by trade so it's like you explain like you you will cause more problems for people if you don't explain in detail what you want than if you do better to spell everything out in detail and then you know then to say oh I want this and somebody makes something that's totally different and, and then you have to go through all these revisions or whatever so that's just how I come to everything and I have learned that people experience precise requests as pressure. 
and that doesn't naturally work in my brain. Like that doesn't mean that to me, but I have found out that that means that to other people. And so it's not, this isn't like a blaming anybody. If anything, it's blaming myself that I didn't realize that sooner. So there were a number of people, including Duango, who felt too pressured by me. Um, and it's not like I was saying, oh, you're a you know, piece of whatever for not doing this. Or it wasn't like that. It was just like, oh, can we get this? Can, you know, can this, this is what I'd like to see. It's this, 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 and this, and this. And then follow up in a week and, hey, did you get a chance to do that? Like, that's what I'm talking about. But people experience that as this huge overbearing pressure. And I found out about that later and that people, you know, had a, didn't have the greatest experience. And, you know, I've apologized to the individuals who talked to me about that, but also it's a learning experience of like, I'll probably be managing people in the future in some form. And if any of you are, that's, that's something to know is, uh, you know, understand people's abilities and meet them at their abilities. But then also if you're working with anybody, you, you got to not sort of not expect more than, than is reasonable. Um, for, for who the person is and what they're what they are capable of offering. And I'm, I'm trying to be careful about saying capable of offering because, you know, even the most brilliant, you know, skilled person in the world, if they're stressed and there's things going on in their life and they're, you know, they're working a full-time job or two and, you know, they're, they have a, like two hours to contribute to something. It's like, it's not that they're not capable of doing it. It's that they're not capable of offering that mm -hmm. to the, the project at, the, at this time. Did you have any comments on that? Yeah, I would say it is very difficult. I've learned a lot of hard lessons and have, in fact, made significant errors. In AGDQ 2017, we had a very ambitious project uh, involving two Nintendo consoles and a Super Nintendo. Uh, it was the it, one with it. the Skype call on the Super Nintendo. Yeah, 20, AGDQ 2017. It was crazy. I pushed too hard, and I pushed my volunteers too hard, and I lost a very important volunteer to me as a result of that. And so this was a lesson I also had to learn as, as a leader is these are volunteers and they can vol and don't. <laughs> they can, if you push them too hard, they leave. <laughs> and it's always really interesting trying to figure and not, out. And not only do they leave, they leave and there is emotional baggage. Too. Right, and there's damage. And then it's not like they're in an employee, you can't make them do something. It's not like they're in any obligation socially to ever talk to you again. So sometimes a, 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 an apology can't even be delivered. Uh, there's all these aspects of working with volunteers that have uh, I've just had to learn as I go. And I think that's a lot of, of what this comes down to, is it's just a learning experience. Every new project you go through, you learn how to interact with people in a different way. Yeah. So next slide. This is the basically the last topic here. So uh, first of all, credit to Rebecca Tripp, um, who I don't know if any of you know her, but she was our sort of uh, guided, I was you know, sort of in, in charge of the scenario, but she was very much guiding my, my thoughts on it. Um, and she also arranged the um, Chamber of Sages music uh, for, for Triforce Percent, the, the you know, hacked up version that we use. Triforce, I, I did Triforce Percent because of what it meant in a artistic and philosophical way. The arbitrary code execution exploit allows us to have complete control of the console. And the Triforce allows Link to have mastery over Hyrule. And so having using Ace to get the Triforce, basically what we did is at, at the beginning, as soon as we did the setup and Link wiggles around and then we get the little green bar and the console is pwned, at that point, Link is effectively a god. He can do whatever he would want to do, but Link, the character in the game, doesn't understand that. He's just been sort of, however you want to say the relationship between Link and the player, but he's just done this weird set of things that he can't understand that have you know, resulted in the fabric of reality changing, but he doesn't understand that. And so the plot that we created made that ability concrete for him by having him not just get the Triforce immediately, but build up to it. It made sense to him and then see the future took that further because it was it was it was us coming together and the, the you know worlds of zelda colliding and then the two the, the zelda world and our world merging together um, so those are the kinds of themes that i cared about here um, and 
you know, I, I did this project because once I had the idea, you know, even before the exploit happened, I felt that this needed to be done. I, I saw it as, you know, as we've said in that, in that line, making people's dreams come true. Um, but there is an, there's an aspect of that that sort of unfolded after the event that I, that I realized about, about what we were doing. Um, and this this will get a little abstract, but I hope I hope this can make sense. And you don't you don't have to necessarily subscribe to any particular philosophy to to you know understand what I'm saying here. But oh, I don't know. I forgot my train of thought. <laughs> Does it perhaps involve uh, some aspects of balance and things that happened in the past coming back in the future? Well, not the balance part, but um, yeah, childhoods and the fulfillment of things, the... Yeah, sorry, I'm just, <laughs> after all this talking, I'm just, uh, my brain, brain completely went blank. I apologize. Uh, an element of karma, perhaps? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you can think about the concept of karma. There's, like, negative karma. You say, oh, you hit somebody, and then they, you know, you, you have some karma in with them, and, you know, again, this, I'm not trying to get into a whole, like, religious thing. It's, it's not really about that, but... We have attachments to things in the world, um, and sometimes those are like negative attachments if we've had some problem with things, but they can also be positive attachments. And um, when people played Ocarina of Time, because of the whole unfinished aspect and you know how there, there was all these the contents left on the cartridge and you know things that the urban legends and all of this, people experienced the game, but their experience with the game wasn't resolved. It was people kept coming back to it and you know seeing you know because they felt like oh well maybe I can find some new thing maybe I can find not you know maybe most people didn't expect oh maybe I can find the Triforce but maybe you know maybe there's some other little piece of something that I didn't discover and you know we made this effectively fan fiction for for Ocarina of Time that we tricked hundreds of thousands of people into watching. Um, but what that did was it allowed, it, it made, those, made those things concrete and allowed, allowed people's attachment, it allowed people to let go of their attachment to the game. It, it resolved the plot and then, you know, people can actually move on. Um, and, you know, you can think of that as a, as a positive or a negative thing of like, oh, well, you know, that's part of the value of Ocarina of Time, that's part of what made it so great is the, is the attachment. But from all of those comments that we got from people of saying, you know, you've, you've, you've you know, touched my childhood and made, made something complete, that, that was really what we were doing, is people had this unresolved attachment to the game, and we created an experience for them that would let them release it. And I don't know if you, any of you are familiar with EMDR, the, the uh, like therapy technique, but it involves sort of going into your subconscious and, um, rewriting your emotional response to some often a traumatic event or something that happened in your past um, and it you know I, when I first heard about this it was like oh I don't I don't want like my memories to be rewritten in therapy I don't like I don't want it, that kind of thing but it's not like at a conscious level it's like allowing you to re go through the emotional experience of something and then have a different resolution to it that allows you to like finish processing it and, and let it go and move, let it move through you and that, you know, again, I didn't realize this until afterwards, but that's sort of what we did here. We created this alternative ending by actually rewriting the game's memory. So it was, again, sort of at the, at the level of, of, you know, what we're doing to the console and also at the level of what people are experiencing from it is this, you know, going back and re rewriting a piece of their childhood and allowing it to be resolved in a, in a new way and allowing them to you know move forward from that so that was the whole you know that connects the whole uh, see the future thing let us create the future together the future of zelda the future of video gaming whatever you want to, however you want to say it um yeah and it, it was really echoed over and over again not just on one video but all of them whether it was ours the one from gdq the one from retro game mechanics explained even the comments consistently echoed the same feeling of you have put together something that completes a piece of my childhood. And the fact that it came from so many different people and such a broad base was what really touched me is that we were able to do something that was far bigger than anything that we, we could have done individually on our own. The team coming together, 
to put all of the heart into the writing, the art, the voice acting, it culminated in something that felt like closure. So I think that was probably yep. the thing that was most interesting. Slide, please. So speaking of closure. And it's 4 o'clock, so yeah. perfect. Um, I'd love to be able to take Q&A. It will depend on when Mag will throw us out of this room because there's something else at 4.30. But we can do a little bit of Q&A until somebody tells us to leave. <laughs> uh, anyone have any? Anyone have any questions? Feel free to step up to the mic and... Uh... Uh, more of a technical question. Uh, yeah. How much data do you guys transfer in the initial portion? And have you guys thought about how long it would theoretically take for a human to actually make all those inputs? Um, so, sort of. Uh, so the, the amount of data, so in the, the initial portion where it was just like the, the up until getting the green bar, that was, I don't remember, there was a you know, few, few hundred bytes. Well, I guess it would be a few, few kilobytes. And then once the green bar hyperspeed loader, then it was about 1.2 megabytes or something like that. Okay. So we filled up like a third of the expansion pack. Okay. And how long would it take a human to do that? We didn't ever calculate that out for the full thing, but yeah. we have just talked a little bit about uh, possibly doing a try first percent RTA in the future, yeah. um, where you use no, no taskbot, just a human. You use the ACE exploit to modify the file select screen. This, is, this part has already been done, so that the oh, okay. limitation on the length of Link's name stops. It, it doesn't exist anymore. Oh, so you can just so you can keep in. typing. Yeah. You start typing Link's name, and you just keep typing into memory, and then you just like type as much as you want. And then you can use that to overwrite things, and you can put in the beginning of a payload. We would, then, so that part has been done by other people for other categories. But then the idea would be you use that to write in a hex editor, and you bring up an on-screen hex editor. Yeah. And then we would just write in the just the Triforce scene, like minimum content, and that would be like, you know, a few uh, maybe 50 kilobytes or something, yeah. or maybe maybe more, uh, maybe 100 kilobytes or something like that. So then it's like, well, how fast can you write 100 kilobytes into a hex editor with an N64 controller? So probably a few hours. Okay. Um, cool. That that would be really like neat that. to see. Yeah. I, I don't plan to try it myself though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, so I actually have two questions. Uh, the first one being. Uh, what? Why did you stop at, uh, say, at the hyper-speed uh, loader? Was there a physical limitation before, um, for example, pulling faster more than eight uh, times per uh, second on the frame. controllers? Oh, eight frames, eight yeah. times per frame on the controller. Yeah. Um, or was that more of a this is probably good enough? Because I know I know you mentioned before that it took sorry, six, seven, eight minutes to do um, mm -hmm. uh, normally. So. Yeah. So uh, we tried sixteen times per frame, but it would start lagging. Um, the, the, so the thing is, the, the N64 is actually kind of a modern computer. The CPU is just a single core, but it has proper multi-threading support. So, like the, the game has like ten threads or something. So the, one of them is done, does controllers, one of them does audio, one of them does, so various things. So the the controller thread it actually doesn't take a lot of CPU time to pull the controllers. It just starts. There's an external chip that does it. It starts that and then waits for it to finish. But while it's waiting, it does other things. So. The thing is that it takes most of the it took it takes actually like half of the wall clock time for each frame to start and then wait for it to finish. But it's not it's not waiting and doing nothing. It's doing useful work during that time. So making it twice as inject twice as much would have uh, made it start lagging and then you know it, it wouldn't have been a great experience. Yeah, as it is, we were able to do that uh, 5400 rate without any noticeable perceivable lag. Yeah. Okay. Uh, for the second one. Did you find the CRC in the packets to be uh, useful during development, or was that's a that... great question? So, um, what happens is when you go through a loading zone, uh, the game will suspend reading confirmed controllers. We don't exactly know. I don't exactly know the whole mechanism behind that, but basically, you get errors every time you go through a loading zone in terms of the injection, and it redoes it. Um, it's not actually CRC fails. It's like it didn't get enough responses of rumbles. Um, so that is absolutely needed for the for the project to work. As far as the CRCs itself, we didn't have any ever any instances of them failing once the code was all working until Duango was at uh, one of your events recently, yeah. and there was some one of these things wasn't clicked in all the way and it was like loose, and then we would we got like a stream of pouring out of like CRC error, and 
then we pushed the thing in and then it continued. Yeah. It so, told me what the problem was. Uh, right. Yeah. I knew there was an issue. We checked our cables. Sure enough, it was a cable. It's always the yeah. cable. So <laughs> it didn't. Um, so yeah, it didn't. It never. It never helped until after Triforce Percent already happened. Yeah. And the four bytes was that just uh, personal? Was that just like a good safe number or was for the it, CRC? Yeah. Like? Yeah. I mean, it's enough that you have a one in four billion chance of it being right. falsely wrong. So that's you know that's good enough. Thank you. Sure. Hi. Hi. Maybe you spoke about this earlier in the presentation. I'm sorry. I had to, I had a few other things that I had to pay attention to. But can you tell me at all? Did you guys ever end up having to use uh, the N64? Is infamously hard, um, or persnickety might be a better word, of a, of getting a handle on in terms of uh, emulation or doing or doing things because uh, Nintendo has their own microcode system like that uh, helps support the soft or help support the hardware and get things running efficiently. Did you guys have to sort of delve into that, or can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, the cell shading required a microcode patch. Okay. Um, so that was really the only part that we changed microcode for. Um, it, it was a simple change to move lighting information from the shade green channel to the shade alpha channel. And that won't make any sense to most people, but uh, yeah, basically the, the system already computes lighting, but it puts the lighting into the color, and we needed to, it to put the lighting into the alpha in order to use the alpha compare, which is how the cell shading was done. So yes, we had to get into that. Somebody made a um, microcode disassembler that was a little buggy. It was good enough for me to be able to modify it, but then I had to actually encode the instructions by hand into machine code and manually write in those machine code values into a file to get part of, as part of the patching. Is that properly answer your question? I guess a yeah, better, broadly, broader yeah. answer would yeah, be that yeah. there are there's a Blender tool called Fast64, which is used for all of the graphics, and um, you know a, a whole bunch of people contributed to that, not just me, but I wrote the cutscene tools for that. There was a previous program that was used for cutscenes in other like older ROM hacks, um, and that kind of was not a great program. <laughs> so um, yeah, so I had to work on Fast64 a bunch for the cell shading and for the cutscenes and stuff. So. Yeah, I got into all the all the nitty gritty graphical stuff. It's it's actually, I wouldn't say it was like a terrible machine to work with. I would say it's it was actually kind of modern, um, a lot more modern than let's say the PlayStation One. Um, though I haven't done serious any you know really any development on the PS One at all. Um, so did that answer your question? Yeah. No. Thank you. For that. All Is right. Anyone here from Mag to tell us to leave? Okay. <laughs> Not yet. Uh, I am, however, going to close it down unless there's yes. any last questions. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for coming to the panel. Thank you for uh, coming for the parts that you liked and putting up with the parts you didn't come here for. Uh, if you want any more information, please head over to discord.gg slash taskbot. Head over to our Discord server. We have a Triforce Percent channel. If you would like one of these rather expensive and quite nice stickers, you don't so, have to tell the public that they're expensive, but okay. <laughs> they're really high quality. Let's yes. go with that. Uh, we have some here on the table, so feel free to come up and grab them. They and, are decals, uh, so you pull off the pull off the back first, and then stick it on the thing, and then pull off the front. Yeah, they are very nice. My son loves them. Uh, for anyone who is listening to this and would like to get involved in future content, uh, we are probably trying to go to space next, so if that's your thing, let me know. Uh, we're always looking for volunteers, and uh, don't think he's not, he's not joking. Yeah, I'm not joking. We're trying to take over a derelict satellite. Don't tell anyone. Uh, <laughs> uh, but that doesn't mean that we can't use your skills, whether it is just as a writer or a moderator or just someone who is interesting to, in, interested in chatting and things. We can always use you, so don't feel like just because we had a lot of people who were very specifically very good at microcode and other random well, things. Well, I wasn't good at microcode when I started, <laughs> and I'm not sure I would say I'm good at it now. now yeah, that sounds all right. Uh, hey, I didn't know any Blender before, and now I know some Blender. So thank yeah, you very I, much. I coerced Dwango into making half of the uh, staff role screen uh, cutscenes because ah, my son even helped. It was awesome. So uh, if I can get my son to help with this, trust me. Anyway, no, he's awesome. He was great to work with. Um, anyway, we're always looking for folks, so head on over. Uh, you can also find more task content. Uh, one of the other things, I'm the senior ambassador, uh, senior staff member of taskvideos.org. So feel free to swing by taskvideos.org to see more tool assisted speedrun content. And head over to task.bot to see more content on real consoles. Most of it actually happens, I'm going to be honest, it happens on youtube.com slash DwangoAC. But I'm DwangoAC, this is Soren, and I think that's it.
We hope you've enjoyed this look back at Taspot history. NAMI is the largest grassroots mental health organization in the United States, and in our current climate, our mental health matters. Visit NAMI.org to learn about the free programs and services near you. You can also call the NAMI helpline at 1-800-950-NAMI or text NAMI to 741-741.